One more guest here for this Wednesday edition of the show. We'll bring on Wes Reynolds for our Wednesday wagering segment. Wes, how's it going today, man? Hey, Adam. Just uh, falling out with this, uh, I guess, heat wave uh, that is coming. It's up to about 20 degrees in Indiana today. How are you? I'm doing well. I'm going to wear shorts when I go run some errands here after the show to uh, celebrate the fact that, you know, it's not single digits anymore, but it's supposed to be 40 in the 40s this weekend. So lucky us, right? Yeah, absolutely. All right, let's chat some NFL here to start things off. I know you and I typically talk a lot of basketball, but I I do want to crowdsource opinions here from all the guests on these two conference championship matchups. So we'll start with 311-312. Jacksonville takes on New England. As we talked about in our previous segment here, this number is sitting between 8 and 10 throughout the week. The 8s that were out there are gone. There's one eight and a half, two eight and a halfs left. Heritage and five dimes showing those. Most of the market, nine, nine and a half. Wes, what do you think about this game? What do you think about this line? Yeah, I'm not sure if this is if this is going to go down. I think it's probably going to stay within this range. Uh, I mean, you may see some books try to bump this up to give themselves a little bit of protection on teasers. Because I would expect if if you're seeing eight and a half in some places, I mean, that could potentially be a tell that maybe some books aren't as worried about their teaser liability as others. I mean, I see Heritage out there at eight and a half, and I also see uh, CG Technology out there at eight and a half. Uh, and obviously a six-point tease down teases you below seven and three. So, you know, that could possibly be, I don't want to overread this, but that could possibly be at least a little bit of a tell in terms of uh, – where books are with teaser liability, because you know that, you know, if, if there's going to be teaser plays, every teaser is probably going to have New England tease down uh, in the, in this situation. If you can get them below three points, that, you know, you're going to see people seeing that maybe as free money. So, I mean, I think it's going to kind of teeter within that range, maybe nine, nine and a half. I'm not sure on game day how high it's going to go. I mean, I don't see this necessarily going to 10 across the board because I do think you'll see some pros and maybe some sharper guys go ahead and take that double digits if they can get it, Uh, you know, whether it's minus 120 or, 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 excuse me, minus 110 or 115, depending on the big. So, uh, you know, I think kind of the line with so much action – on conference championship games. I don't think that this is going to go very much further up or down either way. I think it's kind of going to teeter back and forth in this range. I think this is such an interesting line for a variety of different reasons, because you you have to incorporate the new England teaser protection, as you talked about, and as we talked about with Brian, it's just something you have to do. I mean, getting new England below a field goal here in this spot looks really, really attractive to people. Now finding a second thing to pair with that teaser Maybe not all that easy this week. Total of 46 in this game, total of 38, 38 and a half in the other game. Philadelphia plus nine would maybe be the way to go, I guess, if you want to pair New England with something. But you have to incorporate the teaser protection. You have to probably inflate the New England side a little bit because this is a team as scrutinized as their point spreads are. They are 28 and eight against the spread over the last two years, which is just stupid. I mean, it's, it's crazy. But then you've got this Jacksonville team Sharp money last week that drove the line down to six and a half for a brief moment. You, know, you had them go on the road, beat Pittsburgh, score 45 points in the process with a team that people think can't score. So it's kind of a difficult spot, I think, for the odds makers here this week to sort of balance everything that's going on and, and all the considerations that there are in this game. So I think that as we get closer to kickoff, because we've seen so many sharp moves on game days this year, I think then we'll get a, a real indication of just how much liability there is both on the straight uh, straight sharp side with Jacksonville and then also on the teaser side with New England. Yeah, and also uh incorporating the uh the total within that. I mean, it is a, it is a little bit of a kind of a crapshoot and a little bit of a guessing game in terms of the total. I mean, you have all the power ratings and all the numbers that can, you know, get you to make a total relatively close where it should be, but it's like, is this the Jacksonville team that scored 10 against Buffalo? Or are they the one that scored 45, uh, you know, last last week in Pittsburgh? So, I mean, 
you know, you can't, you, you know, you can't put the total too low where it's going to be around. I mean, number one, play in New England, you can't put something around 43 or 44 because you're going to get smashed with over bets. But you also don't want to put it at 49 or 50 where, where I mean, we're like a lot of the New Orleans Saints totals were throughout the season. I mean, because – you know, there's a tendency that that might look a little high. Uh, open 47, now 46, 46 and a half. Uh, and I think that'll probably be a, kind of a teeter-totter back and forth where I don't know if this is going to get smashed on game day where you're going to see 45s or 44 and a halves, but uh, I don't see this going too north of 47 either. No, and also, too, I mean, you've got this New England team that scored at least 34 points in each of its last four playoff games. So, you know, again, I mean, yeah, they are facing Jacksonville, who had the best pass defense in the NFL this season. But still, you you figure New England's probably going to get theirs just because they always do. And, of course, weather not a factor this weekend either. The look-ahead forecast, sunny and 45. Again, we'll see what the wind forecast looks like. Chance of rain on Monday, so if that – speeds up a little bit, maybe this game gets a little bit wet or a little bit cloudy, something like that. But, you know, it doesn't look like weather is going to be a factor. So, you know, in that respect, you you kind of worry about the total a little bit as an odds maker as well. If weather was going to be a factor, maybe you'd be a little bit more aggressive in terms of shading the number down some. Maybe they'd be at 45 and a half, 45 right now because weather doesn't look to be a factor. Now you kind of got to sit there and wait and wonder, do we get sharp action either way? How much public action do we get on the over? it's a precarious spot for them to be in for sure. Yeah, I think so as well. And plus, I mean, what we've seen with new England, I mean, they're not necessarily in what you would consider to be a, an offense that runs a lot of up tempo, but they're not a team. I mean, that, that throws a ton of deep balls. I mean, they're a team and that's why I think Josh McDaniels, uh, who lo- is looking to be, uh, the next, uh, Colts head coach, uh, and, 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 I mean, they have is in such demand because they have proven they can move the ball, not necessarily throwing it deep. I mean, they can move the ball on screen passes. They can move the ball on intermediate routes. Uh, I mean, how many deep balls do they really throw to their receivers? Not very many. So, I mean, they move the ball throwing, uh, throwing the Gronk on the seam routes and, uh, throw into the backs a lot, throw in a lot of short routes and intermediate routes, and they can really move the ball and put up a lot of points just doing that. So, I mean, they're always they're always a threat. I mean, you know, you don't want to say that they're like an explosive offense per se because they're not, I mean, throwing the ball down the field and, and really going with a vertical game, but they are an explosive offense taking the short and intermediate stuff and they can put up a lot of points in a hurry. All right, let's move to the other game here between Minnesota and, I guess, actually, before we get away from Jacksonville, New England, what are you looking to do with this game? I mean, do do you have an idea yet? Obviously, we've got three full days before game day. The market can move around quite a bit. I know you're doing high volumes of work with college basketball, the NBA, the NHL. You're obviously handicapping golf as well, as we talked about, uh, I think, two weeks ago. Maybe it was last week when we discussed that. So, You've already got a lot of stuff going on. So do you have an inkling on which way you want to go with this game yet, or are you just going to kind of wait and see how the line plays out? Uh, I, you know, a little bit of both, I guess, here. I mean, my lean early would probably be to the under, but I don't necessarily want to jump in as of yet. I mean, there might be uh, something here where I might jump in on a live bet because, I mean, the last thing you want to do is think you've got top number, a really good number with the under, even though it's not maybe the first original number, maybe you get like a 46 and a half or something like that. And then all of a sudden both teams score on the first drive, even if one scores three and one scores seven, well then all of a sudden you can get a total, you know, really close to 50. And then it's like, Oh man, why did I play that? So, I mean, you know, you did, it's just kind of picking the right time to jump in uh, on the side I would maybe be looking a little bit more at, at at the Jacksonville side, certainly, than the New England side, especially if I can get 10 or if I could even buy up to 10 where it's a 9.5 and, and I can take a 10 minus 120. Uh, you know, prefer to take it 110. But, uh, you know, that's kind of 
the direction I would be looking at this game, but I mean, it's not a strong case either way. All right, let's go to the other game here. 313, 314, Minnesota, Philadelphia. If you're listening live, if you're listening live, you've got a Bovada account. You might want to go grab that three and a half. It's out there for Philadelphia, if that's the side that you like, because we are three market wide. The juice is kind of spread out a little bit. Bookmaker three minus fifteen on the favorite. Pinnacle three minus oh seven on Minnesota with three minus oh three on the take back with Philadelphia. But the sharp money has arrived and it is on the home dog much like it was last week between Atlanta and Philadelphia as the Eagles moved on with a goal line stand. So that was a game that hung in the balance there in terms of the straight up winner. Philadelphia would have covered no matter what. So, you know, what do you think about this move, Wes? Yeah, I think it's, I think it's an interesting move. I mean, obviously the, uh, it was on both. It it was on uh, Philadelphia last week as well. And I I was on the Eagles at at plus three. Uh, But, uh, you know, it seems like maybe that there's a little more faith in the Eagles. I think some people were very gun shy about about taking the Eagles. Uh, you know, seeing kind of how they looked in, at the end of the regular season and the fact that there is a clear drop off from Carson Wentz to Nick Foles. But I I think that betters, you know, and maybe even some of the casual betters are a little bit more willing to bet Philadelphia as well this week because you go by what you see and what you saw was them win a defensive game. That was a very low scoring game that they really didn't have to do a lot during the regular season, specifically when Wentz was healthy, uh, they were able to put up a ton of points uh, with uh, that Doug Peterson and Frank Reich uh, led offense. They could run the ball, they could win throwing the ball and uh, that they've got a lot of depth running the ball with the addition of Jay Ajayi uh, plus uh, LeGarrette Blunt, So I think that there's a lot more faith in that. And I think the fact that, I mean, we know that a Super Bowl is on the line, so you're going to get an effort from the Vikings. But when you win that game, like they did last week in the divisional round, in such a dramatic fashion, and, I mean, one of the more dramatic finishes you'll see in an NFL game, and then all, and then have to get back up, and go on the road, you know, for a shot to go to the Super Bowl. After all, after all of that has happened, I mean, you're going to get an effort, but it's it's just tough to, I guess, I don't want to say it's tough to get up for the game. That's not the right way to say it because, I mean, they're going to be up for the game. But all of that emotion can be draining. I mean, with the fact that you were, I mean, you were pretty much dead on arrival. I mean, you know, people talk about the spread, whether you got four and a half, and on four, four and a half on the early or whether you took it late. I actually laid money line, so I was going to be the real stupid guy if they would have gotten that miracle touchdown at the end. But, I mean, they were all but, but dead, and then all of a sudden, you know, you're winning the game. I mean, you're not having to try where it's like, ah, oh, there might be a little bit of a chance if he can get it within 55 yards to get a 55-yard field goal or something. And, uh, I mean, to be able to have that miracle finish and then come back and do it on the road again in the, in the NFC Championship game where even the stakes are higher is very hard to do. And that's why I think you're seeing that early Philadelphia money. I think what's really interesting about this game is I'm going to be fascinated to see where the public comes in. And, and right now, I mean, I would think that the public kind of split on this game, the public that has come in, maybe a little bit slanted toward the Minnesota side, but think about how Minnesota won that game. They basically needed one of the worst defensive plays that we can remember from Marcus Williams, where, you know, he got caught trying to go uh, low, should have probably gone high, didn't want the PI call. You know, there was a lot going on in that split second. But what the public is going to see is exactly what I just said. It was an awful defensive play. This guy made a horrible, awful mistake at the worst time. And Minnesota got lucky to win the game. Now, people are going to forget that Minnesota was up 17 nothing at halftime, was in complete control, and once Andrew Sandejo went out, as I talked about on yesterday or on Monday's show, that completely changed the complexion of the game, allowed New Orleans to get back in it. But, you know, how is Minnesota's win being evaluated by the public? Because, again, that was a play that probably shouldn't have happened. And that guy gets this, Stephon Diggs gets tackled in bounds, game is over. That's it. We're done. New Orleans moves on. Then you look at Philadelphia. 
goal line stand against Atlanta. They scored 15 points. They got in the end zone once, settled for a bunch of field goals. You know, what, what is the, the perception of Philadelphia's win? So I think it's a hard one to gauge you know, where the public may show up on this game because I think the sharp side is clearly defined as Philadelphia. But I don't know where the public comes in. And if Philadelphia becomes a public dog, and I, I don't expect that to be the case, but it certainly is possible, that's a side I'm kind of scared of too. Yeah, I'm in, I'm interested uh, in, in the same way here because, I mean, you know, you kind of look at it a little bit like uh, when you're looking at basketball, whether it's, you know, like college basketball, whether it's a conference tournament or an NCAA tournament where a team maybe kind of gets lucky to get a win, and uh, but, but sometimes you'll see a team where they got their scare the, the game before or the round before, as it were, and then they come out and it's like, okay, you know, we got our scare, we survived, you know, and then they come out the next game with a really big effort. So, I mean, that's one thing that's a little bit, you know, making me a little bit leery. I mean, I haven't really bet this game and I'm still kind of trying to figure it out what I'm going to do here. And that's one of the reasons why it's like, you know, Minnesota's got to be thinking, hey, we're playing with house money. We were getting ready to come in on Monday morning and clean out the lockers, you know, and, and say our goodbyes and, you know, have the players say, hey, I'll holler at you and, you know, see you here down the road sometime in the off season. And now all of a sudden they're still playing. So that maybe could light a spark under Minnesota here of the fact that, you know, we, we should be we should be sitting at home on the couches or starting to plan our vacations, and yet we're still playing and we got a shot at this Super Bowl, which just so happens to be in our own home stadium uh, this year. So, you know, I think that this is actually a very tough game to, you know, really come with, I mean, on a convincing side one or the other. I mean, you know, and then when the game is played, and when the result was, it's like, oh, gee, what was I thinking? Him hauling, going back and forth, and there's a really definitive outcome here. So, you know, I'm going to be interested to see the public perception too, because I think it might be split. I think you know you'll have some team people that do like Philadelphia, where it's like, okay, I didn't think Philadelphia could do it, but they proved it to me in the previous round against the uh, defending NFC champion, and then you'll have some. Liking, liking Minnesota here because they'll look at the fact that Philadelphia, you know, score a touchdown, or, or they did, but I mean, you know, had mostly field goals and really had trouble scoring in the red zone. So, you know, I think you you might not see that definitive pros versus Joes here that you often hear about on an NFL Sunday in this type of big game. I think you're going to have some sharp people on both sides, and I think you're going to have some public people on both sides. Well, and the last thing I ask you about here, a lot's going to be made of this quarterback battle between Case Keenum and Nick Foles, and, and I think both defenses certainly have the chance to shine here in this matchup. The optics of, of the performances for both of these guys last week are very interesting. I mean, Case Keenum was 25 of 40. The only touchdown pass he had was the Diggs play that won the game had 61 of his 318 passing yards on that one play. On the full side, 23 of 30, 246, didn't have a touchdown, but you know took care of the football, didn't throw any interceptions, fumbled a couple of times, but the Eagles were able to recover those, got set once. So you know, the full stat line looks okay from last week's game. Case Keenum's stat line, you know, he got that late touchdown, got over three bills, that looks okay. But if you actually watched both of these games, some wobbly ducks from Foles. Keenum had the back foot throws when the game started getting away from him in the second half and in the fourth quarter especially. Like, watching both of these guys, they both didn't do a great job in terms of the eye test. And, and so I, I'm sort of wondering, you know, again, if, if you're a public better for this game, you're probably not thinking about which defense I can trust more because they're both very good. You're probably not thinking about the coaching matchup with two guys from the Andy Reid coaching tree with uh, – you know, Pat Shermer is the OC and Doug Peterson is the head coach. You're not thinking of how great Mike Zimmer is at game planning the defense. You're probably thinking to yourself, which quarterback can I trust more? And, and I don't really know what the answer to that question is. Yeah, and, and if you don't know the answer to that, then maybe you go to the 
answer of, you know, which coaching staff or which coordinators do I trust more? And, I mean, you know, it's always interesting to kind of look at that angle when you have coaches interviewing for jobs. And, I mean, we kind of saw that a little bit. And I don't know how much of a factor that was in the wild card round where it seemed like the entire Kansas City staff uh, – we're interviewing for jobs, and of course Matt Nagy, now the head coach of the Chicago Bears, but I mean, it was like half the staff was being rumored to be interviewing for the Indianapolis job. You know, it obviously has it didn't affect Josh McDaniels uh, last week, who seems to be the coach in waiting in Indianapolis, but now you have Pat Shermer, who, by all accounts, a lot of people are saying are the front raise the front runner for the Giants job. So, I mean, you know, sometimes you can't help but have that be a little bit of a distraction. I mean, you know, and sometimes it's a distraction. Sometimes it's just business as usual. But you wonder if that's going to play in in terms of uh, of any type of, of game planning or, or, or anything where it just takes so much time away. I mean, And, I mean, we know that this time of year and, you know, the coaches are spending – you know, 14 to 16 hours at the facility, at their respective practice facilities or offices. So, I mean, it's so hard to really find an edge, I think, at the quarterback position. I mean, like you were saying, Foles on the eye test was a little bit shaky. But, I mean, so was Keenum in in the second half. And I thought the Saints did a much better job of bringing pressure. And there were so many times where he just had to roll it out and kind of throw it away. I mean, where, where it was just nothing there, and the Saints were getting stops and uh, kind of really, I think, shut down Minnesota's offense for the entire second half with the exception of that play at the end. So, you know, this is a game where I, I think it's, it's a pretty challenging handicap here. And, I mean, and, and it's always going to be more challenging when you only have two games on the board, you know, where you don't have a usual NFL Sunday or you don't have four games on a, on a playoff weekend you know, or you don't have 16 regular season games. So, you know, it's always going to be hard. So the edges are so small in this game. So a lot of these times when you, when you only have championship games, you're really going on kind of intuition here. Well, and the last point I'll make about this, and we'll transition over to a different topic, is as, as Brian Blessing mentioned on yesterday's show, you're going to bet these games. You're going to watch them. You're going to bet them. But the nice luxury that you have is you don't have to do anything full game unless you really, really want to, unless you feel like there's an edge that's there. Maybe you make a derivative play on the first half or the first quarter or something like that. But this is the beauty of live betting, where you've got this game where you have so many questions going into it. If you're watching this game and you pick up on something like Philadelphia is getting a lot of pressure with the front four, Minnesota's not going to be able to throw it out into open space and break some big plays. You can bet accordingly because of that. If you see that Minnesota is doing a good job of pressuring Nick Foles or doing a good job of stuffing the Philadelphia running game, you can do something live with that. I think this is a game. If you have to have action on it, and I would certainly encourage all of our listeners out there to show as much willpower as possible, because I don't think there are a whole lot of edges in this game. Live bet it. Just look for those things that stand out, look for those angles that you can actually tangibly see as opposed to try to project and then go about it that way. Yeah, I I totally agree. And then also one thing to consider is because there's so few games on the board, you're going to see a lot more, I think, widely spread. I mean, some books do props, you know, most of the year, but the prop market in the regular season is, is a lot smaller and a lot more specified, but when you get in a, you know, especially championship Sunday and then even going into further into the Super Bowl, you get a lot bigger prop market because there are people that might be a little bit unsure uh, in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, what they want to do on a traditional side and total. And if they don't do derivatives, halves or quarters, you know, because you have less games, you may have more time to kind of delve into the prop market. And, and, and look at stuff like that. So, I mean, the, the books, not only offshore, but out in Las Vegas, are going to have a lot more props on these games than they would usually have. Uh, so that's also another way to get involved. Uh, if you don't have a free game play, it's okay not to have a, uh, 
you know, a full game or pre-game play, sometimes it's okay to wait or it's okay to say, you know what, I don't know about the side and the total, but I really like this particular matchup here where you might have receiving yards or rushing yards or how many sacks or whatever. So, I mean, you know, there, there's a lot of different ways to get involved with this game. I mean, you're going to bet it somehow, but it doesn't necessarily have to be the traditional way to go about it. No, I completely agree, and I think that's a really good segue here into talking about college basketball. And, Wes, I had a listener question about the Ken Pomeroy numbers, and and I certainly think if if you are going to bet college basketball, even if you don't want to swear by them because the odds makers certainly use a lot of of Pomeroy influence in terms of putting their numbers together, you still want to make sure that you have that subscription. It's only 20 bucks. It's something that, you know, is, is certainly well worth your time, and I think it's something that, you, know, you you can have a, a lot of success with. But the listener was wondering about the basic numbers that you have there, the basic college basketball ratings on KenPom.com, which is the free data that is accessible to everybody. Now, I'll say this. One thing that you can do, just to the left of 2002 in that line of links, there's a help section. You've got the methodology update and also a glossary. So that may explain things a little bit better for you than we can here on today's show, you know, reading is sometimes a little bit better than hearing because you're generally distracted doing other things, whatever the case may be. But Wes, I think the most important thing to point out here first and foremost about these numbers is that they're based on the, you know, the offensive efficiency, the defensive efficiency and the tempo of playing an average division one team. I think that's the most important thing to to point out here as people are breaking these things down is that you're looking at this, in terms of Villanova against an average team, they'd be the best offense in the country. Purdue against an average team would theoretically be the sixth best offense in the country. So, you know, obviously not all opponents are created equal. Yeah, exactly. And I mean, and when you're looking at, when you're looking at these numbers, uh, one thing to keep in mind, I mean, you just can't use a discrepancy where, Oh, Ken Palm says it should be this, but the books have it as this and then go with the necessarily the Ken Palm numbers. Because one thing I'll tell you, I mean, the betters don't necessarily have that advantage over the books. I mean, every single sports book, I guarantee you, the guys at Westgate or whether it's Bet Online or Five Dimes or, you know, CG Technology or South Point or whatever Vegas or offshore book, they have the Ken Palm subscription too. So, you know, you're not pulling a fast one necessarily on, on these bookmakers. And one other thing to consider, Adam, is, you know, these raw numbers are very good. I mean, it, it's as good of a stat uh, math as you'll find out there. Hoop math is also very good. But these numbers don't necessarily take in situations. And these numbers also, and I'll, I'll try to use an example from last night's card, don't take into injury take into account injuries because they're including the data with the injured players in these previous games. An example last night was uh, uh, Louisville and Notre Dame. I believe the Ken Palm number on that game was minus six. But keep in mind, uh, most of those games were played with Bonzi Colson and were played with a healthy Matt Farrell that, you know, is still, I think, kind of trying to get to 100%, even though he played last night. Uh, so, I mean, yeah, if you have Bonzi Colson and Matt Farrell at 100%, you know, minus six, maybe a little less, or minus five against a, a solid Louisville team is probably fair. But last night, the line was minus three, yet the Ken Palm number had it minus six. And I ended up uh, uh, t- uh, taking Louisville on that because I thought, well, they're not really valuing the injury as much. I mean, taking Bonzi Colson out of that lineup, and not injuries are all mutually exclusive, but taking somebody like Colson out of that lineup really makes Notre Dame a different team. And you kind of saw it last night with Louisville where you had Ray Spalding, who I think is a really improved player, who is uh, only a, uh, is a sophomore now, Ray Spalding kind of had more of his way uh, and and ended up, I believe, having a career high in points last night uh, because you don't have a a guy like Colson down low where, I mean, it's a totally different look. So, so, I mean, you have to kind of take that into account instead of just going by, 
raw numbers and saying, well, Ken Palm has Notre Dame six and the odds makers have it three, so Notre Dame's the play, right? Well, oftentimes that's not the case. No, I, I completely agree. And, and I think, too, you know, the situational element is something that's very, very important. I mean, you talk about playing that altitude double. That's something we talked about with Kyle Hunter on Monday's show where Washington State plays Colorado, plays Utah on Sunday. So that's not going to be factored into a Ken Palm metric with them playing or into that fan match number with them playing a back-to-back in altitude. It's going to be strictly based on the numbers. And it's very important. And believe me, I'm a sabermetric guy when it comes to baseball. I love diving into those advanced numbers. They cannot be the be-all, end-all. Much like power ratings, if you do them for college football or the NFL or NBA or whatever else, they cannot be the be-all, end-all. You have to incorporate adjustments for these situational spots, you know, obviously adjustments for injuries as well. I would say this, though. Of the basic Ken Palm metrics that are available for free over there at the website, I think looking at the strength of schedule-adjusted metrics – are something that can have some value for you because they're incorporating the opponents that teams have played. And I think they're especially important when you look at the bottom conferences, the low major and the mid majors, because if you're a team that really scheduled up in the non-conference, now you're playing teams that are ranked, you know, in the two hundreds, the two thirties, the two sixties, whatever the case may be, you're a little bit more battle tested, so to speak. You've played some of those better opponents. I think that column you know, the one that's a little bit further over to the right under the strength of schedule heading, if you're going to use the free Ken Palm data for anything, I think that's what you want to try to incorporate into your, incorporate into your handicap, want to try to look at. Again, you don't want to treat them as gospel because nothing is gospel. But I think if you want to factor in some of the mathematics, that's what I would use from, from what's available uh, you know, from a, without buying a subscription. Yeah, and I mean, a perfect example of that, and I'm not necessarily – using this team to endorse it to say, hey, bet this team blindly. But one team that you find uh, that does this seemingly every year is out in the Big West with Long Beach State. I mean, they absolutely schedule a nightmare schedule. They don't win a lot of games in December. Uh, You know, I mean, you're not going to win a lot of games when you're playing, uh, you know, teams that they've played, whether it's Kansas or whether it's North Carolina. I mean, you know, some of these schools in these middle to lower major conferences also use that as a recruiting tool. Like, hey, man, you're going to play in the biggest arenas in the country. You're going to play at North Carolina. You're going to play in Kansas. You're going to play at Indiana. You're going to play at Louisville or Syracuse or, or wherever. So, I mean, but then when a team like that gets into conference play, I mean, the most notorious example of that is Texas Southern in the SWAC, but there's not a lot of SWAC games on the board unless they're that – Monday night kind of TV game, or maybe when they get into the conference tournament. But uh, you see a little bit of a little bit of those edges. I mean, obviously Long Beach State playing these, you know, top fifteen, top twenty teams, and then all of a sudden you get in the Big West, where probably the best team is rated maybe in the one ten, one fifteen, one twenty range. So, you know, you're playing a lot of two hundred teams. You know, once you have been tested, and then now you're playing Cal State Fullerton and, and Cal State Northridge. Uh, but the only, the only thing is you've got to consider, too, with a team like a Long Beach State, is that are they beat to hell because they've overscheduled, which I, I think that they kind of do, uh, you know, where you're just playing all these tough teams. And I know some of that with, like, a Texas Southern or a SWAC or a MEAC school, a lot of that is budget-related uh, to get the uh, – to get the uh, – the honorarium, so to speak, and to get the cash, you know, to help kind of fund your athletic department. But, uh, you know, using that schedule strength, I think, is kind of a a big deal here. When you're seeing these power, especially at the Power 5 teams, playing these teams in non-conferences, and you see a lot of opponents in the 200s there, whereas you see a team that might have a worse record, where you've seen them play a lot of teams in the top 50 or top 60. One last thing I'll mention here about the Ken Palm numbers, since uh, we had a question about the abbreviations as well. The ADJEM is the adjusted efficiency margin. That's just subtracting the adjusted defensive efficiency from the adjusted offensive efficiency. So in theory, Villanova should beat an average Division I team by 31 points per game. The strength of Schedule One is the same thing where it subtracts across the board. But you know, what I'm talking about in terms of, of the strength of schedule is look at a team like Houston. They're ranked 41st right now. 
their adjusted efficiency margin, they would beat an average D1 team by 16 points per game. They're 34th in adjusted offensive efficiency, 62nd adjusted defensive efficiency. But based on opponent's offense and opponent's defense, they've played the 219th schedule in college basketball. So maybe that's a team that you look at when they play a Wichita State, an SMU, a Cincinnati, something like that. Maybe you expect them to have some struggles because, yeah, they've played very well, and they would do very well against average Division One teams, but they've played a bunch of nobodies. They've played a very weak schedule. So they played the 240th non-conference straight to schedule. So I think that's where you can use some of these metrics to your advantage in terms of, of trying to find some edges out there in the college basketball market. Wes, I know you mentioned hoop math. Are there, are there any other ones that you use as well as good resources? Those are the ones I kind of use. I know that there are other stuff out there that, uh, you know, some of the actual basketball program, the actual teams and programs use. Uh, Synergy, I, I think, is one of them. Hoop math is actually something I kind of discovered this year, and I've kind of just recently discovered it. I haven't even subscribe to it yet i think i'm going to just to add kind of another tool but uh you know and i and i think another thing i want to point out a little bit on the ken palm is that i think it's a little bit better and i think you can exploit it a little bit more at least i'm finding on my experience you know others may vary but uh you can use it a little bit more on discrepancy on the size maybe than you can on the totals because one example I'll look at last night, and it, you know, coincidentally you brought up an AAC team there with Houston, Cincinnati and UCF last night. I think the, the fan match total was maybe 115 or 116 or something, but yet the total, I think on the game, I think it closed a little bit lower, but it was around 120-something uh, was the actual total that was put out there. And – you know, initially you'd want to say, well, this game is going to go over. Uh, you know, you will kind of want to play the opposite of that, like you might do with the side. But with the totals, I think it's a little bit harder to exploit, and I think the edges are so much smaller. And then, sure enough, uh, you look at the game last night, I think it was, uh, you know, the total ended up being, I think, I think they might have gotten over 90 points. It was like 19 to 15 in the first half. And then uh, – UCF uh, kind of uh, fell apart late. And, you know, bringing up Houston, uh, not to get too specific, but, I mean, bringing up Houston last night, looking at that AAC, you've got a couple really bad teams in the bottom of the conference with East Carolina and South Florida. So that's going to skew a lot of numbers in that league as well. So, I mean, like a team like Houston, who's in the bottom of the top 40, they're beating the teams they're supposed to beat. But then you've got to take into account when they play a Wichita or when they play a Cincinnati, you know, are they really that close to those teams? So, uh, you know, I think, uh, you know, and this kind of to conclude my thought, I mean, with, with the totals, you know, you can't necessarily, I don't think long-term, you know, in specific games you can, but long-term I don't think you can – kind of use the totals on the Ken Palm as much as you can the size to kind of exploit any kind of line discrepancies. Well, we'll make sure to talk some NBA on next week's segment. If you're interested in tonight's NBA card, I'm sure Wes will be posting that on Twitter at Wes Reynolds and the number one, but Wes, great discussion here on both NFL games and also this Ken Palm commentary. And I will talk to you again next week. All right, Adam, always a pleasure being on, man. Great stuff there on today's show with Wes Reynolds at Wes Reynolds and the number one on Twitter. One thing I did want to mention here at the tail end of today's show is by now, I'm sure everyone's heard about uh, the suicide of Tyler Holinsky, uh, who is going to be probably the starting quarterback for the Washington state Cougars next year. And it, it is one of those things that, that sends ripples throughout you know, the, the circles of people that I follow on Twitter. And, you know, a lot of them obviously sports based and, you know, uh, Suicide is, is a tragedy no matter who it happens to, uh, even the worst of the people out there, you know, just getting to that point, you know, figuring out that, that maybe there's nothing that can be done. Uh, but, you know, for those of you that have experienced some sort of mental health issue, some sort of mental illness, uh, there are people out there that want to listen. You know, one of the, the best decisions that I've ever made in my lifetime was 
you know, when I was going through uh, some difficulties and some rough patches, I talked to somebody and, you know, sometimes it really helps to have that impartial ear that can listen to you. Somebody that, that knows nothing about you, has no preconceived notions. you know, not somebody that you've had talks with before. You're just reaching out to somebody that is trained in it. You know, there should be no stigma with mental health. There should be no stigma with going out and getting the assistance that you need. And, and it should never come to a point like it did with Tyler Holinsky, like it's done with, with so many other people that, that we know out there and, you know, even celebrities as well. And it really hits home when you talk about somebody that, that has a future, that, that has a lot to live for. You know, he had siblings, a younger brother that's currently taking college offers, was probably going to be the starting quarterback at Washington State next year. Maybe that gets parlayed into an NFL future down the line or, you know, maybe a job in coaching, something like that. And, and to see him take his own life, you know, I, I think that it really uh, becomes a sobering reminder that, you know, uh, it, it, it almost doesn't matter if you've got a lot to look forward to, if you just have this destitute lifestyle and, and have no family, no friends, you know, mental health can affect everybody. So for any of our listeners out there that are dealing with something, I would certainly implore you to get help whether you talk to friends, whether you talk to a medical professional, whether you call the suicide hotline, whatever you do, you know, it should never get to a point where you want to take your own life. And, and obviously condolences going out to Tyler Holinsky's family and, and the Washington state community there um, in Pullman. But, you know, again, there are people that will listen, whether they're people that are you know, trained in listening, paid to listen, friends of yours, you know, just people that, that have experienced it as well. You know, um, there should be no stigma attached to it. There's nothing takes away your masculinity or, or your femininity or anything in terms of getting help. So certainly for all of our listeners out there, you know, as we try to process another reminder of, of just how, you know, um, how all encompassing mental health issues can be. You know, I just hope our listeners out there do get the help that they need if they need it, or, you know, encourage your friends and family members to get the help that they need as well, because, uh, you know, as I said, it should never come to what it came to for Tyler Holinsky yesterday. And, and if my little blurb here at the end of the show encourages anybody to go out and get help or keeps anybody from doing something to themselves or possibly to somebody else, you know, then, um, then I'd be very happy and, and very appreciative to have this platform and have the opportunity uh, to give out some of those thoughts here at the tail end of today's show.